Guess what? Blue Note announced 16 new titles in their classic vinyl reissue series. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about all 16 of them. Before we get started, uh, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, and follow me on Instagram at what underscore can underscore brown. All right, before we get into the series one by one, there's just a couple of quick things I wanted to talk to you about uh, the series overall because it's actually common across all of them. So first of all, what is the Blue Note Classic series? Well, it's kind of a continuation of the 75th anniversary series, which started in 2014, kind of extended into 2015. So what they did in 2019, they decided to, uh, to, to launch a brand new reissue series Instead of the 75th, they called it the 80th anniversary series. And it seems to me that they, uh, the whole intent behind this was to do what they did before, but do it better, right? So um, with this series, which by the way is now called the classic uh, vinyl reissue series because now it's extended across so many years. So why do you call it 80th anniversary when we're basically in the 85th anniversary already? Don't worry about that. It's all considered the classic vinyl reissue series. Um, so a couple of things. One is that all of these releases cost $27.98. They are all on 180 gram vinyl. They could either be mono or stereo, and I'll get into that as we uh, go along. Um, and what else? They're all um, they're all mastered by Kevin Gray, and they're all pressed at Optimal. Um, so that's kind of the that's sort of the lay of the land, and again, consistent across all releases. So let's um, start digging into them. All right, so guess what? Here's something interesting. Every single title on this list, all 16, actually all but one, so 15 of them, I have in the original format, the original pressing. So I'm gonna be able to show that to you, which um, you know I suppose is uh, what, what you gain is that um, it's not just me doing cutaways like I sometimes do in my videos. Instead, I get to show you what the original, uh, what the original pressing looks like. Um, so let's let's dive right in. The first two releases are coming up on September 15th of this year, and the very first one is Horace Silver Quintet and Trio, and the title is Blowing the Blues Away. So as I mentioned, Quintet and Trio, there's a couple of trio tracks, the rest are Quintet. The lineup here is Blue Mitchell, Junior Cook, Lewis Hayes, and Gene Taylor. This was originally put out in 1959, actually just a few months. I want to say it was recorded just a few months after Finger Poppin', uh, which was another great one for Blue Note, and it actually has the very same lineup. Um, so the last time that this was released was part of the 75th anniversary series. So you may say, hey, it hasn't been that long. Guess what? A lot of these in this, in this list of 16 were released in the 75th anniversary series. It's not a bad thing they're being put out in the classic vinyl series. One of the reasons why is that the 75th anniversary series were all mastered at, uh, by Capitol. And um, the new series is mastered by Kevin Gray, and it's on 180 gram vinyl. I actually do think that there is going to be a significant quality sort of upgrade here to where for those folks who maybe had the 75th might actually be worth um, listening to, you know, the 80th and possibly replacing. I, I don't know. I actually don't have any of the 75th anniversary series titles. I only have a couple of the 80th so far. Um, so otherwise, if you didn't get the 75th anniversary series and you're looking for a more recent edition, well, you'd have to go all the way back to 2010 when Analog Productions put out a double disc 45 RPM format that was also mastered by Kevin Gray as well as Steve Hoffman. All right, so on this, uh, on this album, there are seven pieces. So fairly short format, probably a little bit leaning into radio play with some of these, or at least having radio partially in mind in terms of, the, um, in terms of uh, how they sort of situated these tracks. Um, I think the title track is a really good example. So Bl uh, Blowing the Blues Away is a really good example of like a super crisp horn line uh, by Mitchell and Cook with a really driving rhythm section. Um, it's a very blues heavy piece as well as the, uh, as the name probably suggests. And there's really nice solos, first by Junior Cook and then by Blue Mitchell. Um, it just sound really clear and really warm, um, just like great tones. It's, a, it's an excellent uh, track. So preview that. If you've never heard this before, preview that one. Um, maybe another Sister Sadie, which I actually think was another one of the sort of singles that were on this album. Really catchy melody and again, great um, solo, especially by Blue Mitchell, as well as some of the others. Um, the two trio tracks are, which are they? It's uh, St. Vitus Dance, and then the other one is Melancholy Mood. Um, those are the trio recordings. Um, St. Vitus is excellent, I think, in particular. Um, and, and it's also, I would say, also one of those tracks that if I think about Horace Silver and what he's known for, that one is like top three tracks that I'm just like so closely associate to Horace Silver and his style. 
All right, so the next one up also on September 15th is Jimmy Smith Midnight Special. Now, don't get me wrong. I know when you hear Jimmy Smith, you think, hey, maybe I have to be careful. Um, is, is that one worth, uh, worth picking up? I assure you this particular one definitely is. I'm a huge fan of Midnight Special. Um, so a couple of things about Jimmy Smith. I think we all know that he recorded a ton, especially for Blue Note. Guess what? His first album didn't come out until he was 31 years old. And that debut was for Blue Note. So he was 31. As a point of comparison, Lee Morgan, by the time he was 31, had like 20 albums that he had put out already. Um, not, it's not that it's a competition with Jimmy Smith starting a little bit late. Um, it ends up that Jimmy Smith was one of the most prolific artists for Blue Note. Um, I want to say between him and Horace Silver, I forget who had more albums because Horace Silver uh, recorded well into the, um, gosh, even like the late 70s, right? Um, so anyway, um, yeah, very prolific artist. This is the second album. This is just the second album that Jimmy Smith put out in quartet format. So he had done some trio stuff and they had done some big group stuff, but I actually think that Jimmy Smith's best stuff is his quartet format where he added that, uh, that saxophone, in this case, Stanley Turrentine. Um, so this one was recorded, let's see, just after Home Cooking, and it was actually the very same session as back at the Chicken Shack. So in this, in one session, they recorded this entire album and Back at the Chicken Shack, and those two albums, I would say, are my favorite Jimmy Smith records overall. Um, so let's see, these were recorded in April of 1960, um, and in really just even a few weeks, we keep, now I'm talking about all these other sessions, but it was recorded just a few weeks after uh, Open House, as well as Plain Talk, which ended up getting released in the Liberty area, or era, but they, uh, but they belong back in 1960. Um, so yeah, all right. So who's on the uh, who's on the lineup? Well, um, who do we have? We have uh, Donald Bailey, Kenny Burrell, and Stanley Turrentine here. Um, so the last time that this was released was also that 75th anniversary series. It was put out by Analog Productions in 45 RP, uh, RPM format in 2010 as well, just like on the previous one. Um, so like I said, I really like these sessions where they pulled in saxophone. And I think especially anytime that you get a stereo version, this one happens to be mono, I'd love to have a stereo version. It really um, sort of elevates the music overall. I think that the best way to hear Jimmy Smith, and maybe it's because of how the organ kind of reverberates, maybe it's because of that horn line or the fact that there's always a guitarist, because Jimmy Smith always played with a guitarist, um, as opposed to any like, um, you know, any uh, piano. Um, well, obviously he wouldn't have played with the piano, but he always played with a guitarist. Um, and yeah, anyway, the stereo format is just, um, I think, the best way to uh, to hear this stuff. There is like a little bit of that slight echo of Turrentine sax that almost sounds alongside the organ, like almost like lo-fi. Like the organ is like this lo-fi kind of like thing that's supporting the saxophone. And it's just a really cool like late night vibe. And I think probably... In addition to obviously referencing the train, that's probably one of the reasons why they called it Midnight Special. So if I was gonna preview a track from this one, I would uh, probably preview uh, a subtle one, which is track two on side one. Um, and if you check out Why Was I Born, which is also, let's see, no, that was on um, that was on side two. I would say that one is a little bit more of the churchy thing that maybe some people um, tend to shy away from. More of a slow ballad, although Turrentine has a nice melody, um, but probably a little bit too slow for me. But otherwise, overall, I think this is a great album. And again, I would, um, I would preview a subtle one if you're deciding whether this is something you're going to pick up. All right, moving forward to October 20th, we have an Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers title. Really excited about this one, and this is Mosaic. Um, so what about Mosaic? Well, it was recorded and released in 1961. It's actually the ninth album that uh, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers put out for Blue Note, depending on how you look at it in terms of recording date and like release date. But I think generally it's, you know, it's kind of about the ninth album and we're not including when Horace Silver led the Jazz Messengers. Anyway, it's complicated. Um, so the lineup here, well, we have Jimmy Merritt, Cedar Walton, Wayne Shorter, Curtis Fuller, and Freddie Hubbard joining Art Blakey. Just a fabulous lineup. Um, this is another one that was put out in that 75th anniversary series. Before that, you'd have to go back to 2013 to get it on Music Matters, 45 RPM format. Um, so what about this music that's maybe a little bit different than the other formats, other than that maybe this lineup was somewhat short-lived? I think that this is even more loud and raucous than most, right? So Art Blakey really liked 
just you know hammering the drums doing these like loud solos having dense horns and there's a lot of that on here and so I think that um, you know what you gain I think is excitement maybe what you lose a little bit is that um, there's there's so there's not really a separation of horns in some of these choruses um, and so it's kind of sometimes hard to hear just because there's so much energy and, and that's even you know saying that within the context of this original which by the way is mono and i think that the uh, the reissue is going to be in stereo so it would be very interesting is if the dual channel actually allows a little bit more separation of horns it's going to be something to look out for now that i think about it um i would say that if you're going to preview a track start with funnily enough i'm going to say start with the very last one crisis um, this one was written by Hubbard, and man, he has a really nice, really nice solo on uh, on that track. Okay, next one up, also on October 20th. This one is iconic. It is Hank Mobley, No Room for Squares. Just a fantastic, fantastic cover. Um, I, I just, I love the image, I love the photograph, I love everything about it. Um, so this one was recorded over two sessions in 1963 with very different lineups. So to put it sequentially, this would have been after workout and before the turnaround. Um, so uh, taking a look at that lineup, let's see, you have, um, you're gonna have multiple people on the same instruments, right? Because I said there's two formats. So you have either Herbie Hancock or Andrew Hill on, um, on piano. You have either Lee Morgan or Donald Byrd on trumpet. Um, John or or Butch Warren on uh, on bass, and then you have Philly Joe Jones, and he uh, he and Hank are on both sessions. So this one was last put out on some sort of weird format in 2017. I think the label was called just Jazz Classics, which is really confusing when you consider the name of this reissue series or the fact that there's original Jazz Classics. It's neither of those things. I don't know anything about it. Um, otherwise, there was the 75th anniversary um, edition in 2014, and there was an Analog Productions 45 RPM in 2009. So there are a lot of options. However, I think a mix of quality as well as price, uh, if you don't have a copy yet, this is gonna be one to probably take a look at. Um, all of the tunes on here are either composed by Lee Morgan or Hank Mobley, which I think is really exciting because both of them were fantastic um, composers. Um, I would say that there's very much a tone difference, tone difference between the uh, between the sessions, where the earlier session um, that only produced two of the tracks on this record, a little bit more modal, and the later session is a little bit more traditional hard bop. I don't want to just paint a you know sort of broad strokes here and just call it that, but I would say generally speaking, that's that's kind of what you get between the two, and there, there's just a little bit of a, um, a difference in style um, between the two, and it's not a problem. So the tracks here are very much solo vehicles, and that's probably gonna be obvious given some of the folks that you have on here. Um, I would say that the opening tune, um, which is three-way split, is one of the highlights, it has a really nice solo by Lee Morgan, and so I would um, certainly check that one out. All right, we are moving on to November 17th, and this one is special. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is that I think most of the people who know, um, who follow this channel, know that I'm a bit of a completist, especially with Blue Note, and I collect mostly vintage and mostly first pressings. So when you look at the Blue Note catalog, I think I have the entire 4100 series, the entire 4200 series um, in their original form, and the 4000 series, um, I think I'm missing two. Maybe one. No, I think two. And True Blue by Tina Brooks is one of them. And guess what? It's not one that I'm going to get. This is one that I should have picked up when I first started collecting. Now it's out of hand. I'm never going to get an original, but I'm okay with that. Um, it's not going to keep me up at night. There's other possibilities out there, including this one on the Classic Vinyl series. So um, what about Tina Brooks's True Blue? Well, it is one of the rarest titles in the entire Blue Note catalog for sure. Um, and certainly the rarest or at least most expensive of anything after the 1500 series. Okay. Um, it is also the first and only album that Tina Brooks led uh, that was actually put out during his lifetime. Um, so his situation was, I'm not going to get into this too much, but he, he didn't really stick around that long. He struggled with addiction and he simply left the scene. So he was recording um, throughout the 50s. His, uh, he, he put this out in, um, well, in like, what was it, 1960? Well, it was recorded in 1960, and his last recording for anybody was on Jackie's Bag, Jackie McLean's album in 1961. 
But he didn't die in 1961. He didn't die in 1962. He died 13 years later in 1974. So very tragic in that he left the scene, struggled with addiction for so long, and, uh, and didn't go back to music. Um, so this particular album, um, let's see, the lineup includes Sam Jones, Art Taylor, Duke Jordan, and Freddie Hubbard. This is a very desirable album by everyone, not just me. Um, so it was re last released uh, by Music Matters in um, 2016 on 33 RPM format in blue vinyl, which they didn't do very often, but they did it for this one. It was also in the 75th anniversary series, which came out in 2015. There was a standard black vinyl 33 RPM edition um, in 2014 by Music Matters, and it even had a double disc 45 RPM by music matters as well. So it kind of had like, there, I don't know, there was just a lot of uh, different, you know, uh, variations or abilities to get it. And yet, because it's such a desirable album and because the original is so pricey, um, all of them are kind of expensive. So I am excited uh, for this uh, for this 80th or the, the classic vinyl uh, series edition. Um, phenomenal music overall. Just the, the entire album is phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. I would check out the track uh, if you're thinking about, you know, should I buy this or not? Check out Good Old Soul. Um, I personally think that that's one of the best solos that Tina uh, delivers on this album. And then certainly if you really like Tina Brooks, uh, there have been some of those shelf sessions that have been released, including by Tone Poet. So definitely look into those as well. All right, also on November 17th, this one is also just really exciting. And by the way, I'm gonna give a recap at the end of the ones that I think are the most exciting, but obviously the reason why I'm giving you tracks that I think you should preview is so you can figure it out for yourself. Um, but this one is Wayne Shorter's Night Dreamer. Um, it, the, the, uh, the beauty of the music matches the beauty of the cover. This thing is just gorgeous. So let's see, this is uh, Wayne Shorter's debut for Blue Note as a leader. It was recorded in April of 1964, uh, a few months before Juju, um, and actually leveraging most of the same lineup. In fact, the exact same lineup, except Lee Morgan was not on uh, Juju. Um, so speaking of lineup, you have uh, Lee Morgan, Reggie Workman, Elvin Jones, and um, the etc. is McCoy Tyner. This would not be the only Blue Note album where McCoy Tyner is listed as etc. I believe. I think there's, I forget what the other one is. Um, so let's see, the, the last time that this was put out was in 2017 by Music Matters. Also had a 75th anniversary series edition and a 45 RPM Music Matters edition in 2010. Um, so Shorter wrote all of the compositions himself. And so I think that that makes this extra sort of special. Not only was his first album as a leader, but he also penned all of the compositions. He was already writing for uh, the Jazz Messengers as well as for some other musicians at this time. But um, I personally think that almost more than, I'd have to think about this, but I wanna say almost more than any other musician for Blue Note, was he equally a composer as well as a musician and just really excelled at both of those things. Just really gorgeous music and as the title as well as the cover might suggest, has a very nighttime type of feel. Um, so I would say if you're gonna start somewhere, check out the, uh, the title track, Night Dreamer. Very peaceful, um, a little melancholy. Black Nile, um, which is, where's Black Nile? It's the first track on side two, is also really nice. Um, has a really nice Lee Morgan feature as well. Um, each of these songs are over six minutes. And so, you know, don't get me wrong, they're not the, um, not like, you know, 10 minute, you know, kind of extended length things. But I think there's enough space on each of these tracks with the, uh, the shortest being over six minutes that there's a decent enough ability for them to reach within these um, pretty sort of innovative and exciting compositions. All right, moving on, December 15th. Um, by the way, I don't know, hopefully this isn't too fast for you. What I'm trying to do is get through this so I can get back to listening to music. Um, I'm also um, taking a sip of beer in between each of these, um, in, in between each of these albums so I can get through it. So um, this, uh, this uh, next one is uh, Sonny, uh, Sonny Rollins. So again, December 15th, Sonny Rollins, Nukes Time. So this was recorded in September of 1957 and um, lineup includes Winton Kelly, Doug Watkins, and Philly Joe Jones. This one also had a 75th anniversary series. It was also on Music Matters, double LP, 45 RPM in 2012. So here's the challenging thing, or here's the um, thing to look out for. Uh, so the rumor is that there were tape issues with this one, which makes reissues quite difficult. Apparently, some people who bought the Music Matters edition said that there were dropouts in the vinyl 
Um, and yet I've also heard in some other forum that possibly Music Matters was supposed to have resolved the issues. I don't know how they can have both the release as well as have resolved them, but have there be problems reported. But in any event, um, anything Sonny Rollins um, for me is, uh, is a good thing. If I was going to uh, seek out any track to take a look at, it's the first one um, on side one. It's called Tune Up. Um, so I think something that is really nice about Rollins, he was very comfortable with doing, was being that solo horn and um, sort of soloing over a more stark rhythm section. And I think that Wynton Kelly here does a really good job of providing the right amount of accompaniment for Sonny Rollins, because uh, Sonny Rollins didn't like overbearing um, you know, accompaniment. He, he, would, he was known for doing, especially into the 70s, just soloing for like multiple hours apparently at, the, at a time. Um, here though, I think that Wynton Kelly um, just has this almost like twinkling kind of nature to, um, to the uh, upper range of the, uh, the, the uh, piano, and it just sounds really, really nice alongside uh, Sonny Rollins' tenor. All right, also on December 15th, which means it's gonna be a good holiday season for all of us interested in, um, in jazz vinyl. Uh, so this is Green Street by Grant Green. Um, this particular copy, no one will ever pry from my hands. I love this music. This was recorded in April of 1961. It is Grant Green's first as a leader, um, and it includes uh, Ben Tucker and Dave Bailey. So think about that, it is a trio uh, with Grant Green at the helm. This is very unusual. Um, so, so first, um, this was last released in 2015 on Music Matters. Before that, there was an Analog Productions double LP 45 RPM format in 2019. But back to that, um, that comment about it being unique because it's a trio. So Grant Green played with either an organ or a piano um, in all of his other Blue Note sessions as a leader, in every other one except for Green Street. Um, and he had another 20 albums, right? So that was like a very sort of, I don't know, concerted choice either by him or possibly by the producers. Um, so what is created here and what makes this album special is because it is so dang sparse and it really highlights Grant Green's guitar um, because of that. In fact, in, in some ways it reminds me of that great Riverside album by Wes Montgomery. It might just be called Wes Montgomery Trio where it's like a white uh, background and like a drawing or something. I don't know, in some ways this reminds me of that, but um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's guitar alongside bass and drums. And so without any other melodic instrument, you're, you just have to, you can't do anything other than have your attention on Grant Green and, and he just really, really delivers. All right, the next release date is January 19th of 2024. And this is what I'm gonna call the old stuff release date. <laughs> so the first one is the amazing Bud Powell, and this is volume one. Um, so this is this is even older than, than it might suggest based on it being catalog number 1503. So one of the sessions is from August 1949 um at wor studios so this is one of the uh, this is the first out of what we've been covering today that is not recorded by rudy van gelder that session has fats navarro uh sonny rollins tommy potter and roy haynes um, there's another session here that is from may 1951 and that is also at wor studios and that just has curly russell and max roach accompanying um bud powell in trio format um so RV, uh, rudy van gelder did remaster these but he didn't record these so otherwise, if you're going to try to find this, there are some recent releases, including the 75th anniversary series in 2014. Nothing else really since the 80s. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention, though, is that this isn't technically the first pressing. It didn't come out in the 1500 series first. It actually came out in 10-inch format. And so because I like vintage pressings, um, what I have to show you is both the original Bud Powell um, 10 inch, which is catalog number 5003. And then I also have the uh, Fats Navarro. Mine has some, um, probably a kid drew on it, but uh, the Fats Navarro 10 inch release. So this is um, catalog number 5004. So these are very early recordings. There is an early sound to them. I will be interested to hear what happens in terms of what they do um, for the uh, the classic vinyl edition. Guarantee you it will be in mono because there's obviously no stereo recording this early. Um, I think that not everyone is gonna love this uh, this early music and yet 
Bud Powell was just so instrumental. Um, that was a little bit of a pun, but he was so important uh, to uh, to music and as a composer, and he was a big influence on so many others that I think um, you know. I personally think that this is just uh, essential listening if you're if you're a fan of this music. All right. Also on January nineteenth, I mentioned this is old stuff. So we've got Clifford Brown Memorial Album, originally catalog number fifteen twenty six. One of the kind of interesting things in terms of determining whether you have a first pressing is whether this uh, banner down below is blue versus what white, and the blue is the earlier one. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is what that album looks like. Um, there's a big lineup here, and the reason is because it's a mix sort of a compilation of multiple sessions. Uh, and that lineup includes Gigi Grice, Lou Donaldson, Percy Heath, Philly Joe Jones, Art Blakey, Elmo Hope, John Lewis, and Charlie Rouse. So there's a lot of folks here. Um, if you were gonna get this otherwise in 2014, 75th anniversary series, also there's a Music Matters double LP 45 RPM in 2010. Um, and similar to the Bud Powell, this is sourced from 10 inch editions. So what I have to show you, which is kind of fun, is um, this is catalog number 5030 with Lou Donaldson and Clifford Brown in uh, the leader spots called New Faces, New Sounds. Uh, really, really cool. But um, a number of these, um, again, a number of these tracks are on this album. And then I think maybe the remainder are on some other reissue or some other compilation. I don't know. Um, it's it's the matrix is complicated in terms of what sessions later became reissued on what um so the other uh, source material for this uh, memorial album is also this 10 inch which is 5032 um and this is the one that has uh, gg grice charlie rouse um yeah john lewis percy heath and art blakey so for me anything clifford brown is great um i was a trumpet player at one time and clifford brown was my earliest influence and i just absolutely love his uh, early work in mrc with uh, with max roach um especially parisian thoroughfare and dahoud and like all of these there's just great um just just great uh songs and, and compositions that uh that uh, brown was behind so i'm a huge fan um, and I think when you listen to this music, what the first thing that you're going to realize is, you know, what influence not only he had on musicians, but what influence he might have been able to have if he didn't die at the age of what, like 24 or 25. So very tragic, but um, I just, I absolutely love anything Clifford Brown. All right, so moving on to February 16th. Um, this is one of many moments we've all been waiting for, I think, and that is because Lee Morgan's Search for the New Land is coming out that day. So uh, this album was recorded in 1964, but actually it was shelved until 1966. And I believe the reason why was because the Sidewinder had just come out, became a massive hit, and Blue Note wanted something that sounded like the Sidewinder. This does not sound like the Sidewinder, but I think in a really good way. So anyway, they, they temporarily shelved it. So who do we have on this? Pretty large uh, format. Um, so you've got Wayne Shorter, Grant Green, Herbie Hancock, Reggie Workman, and Billy Higgins on this. Uh, there is an SRX Music Matters edition that came out in 2020. I actually have a copy of that because I'm insane. Um, there's also a 33 RPM Music Matters edition in 2016. That's the non-SRX. Uh, there's a 75th anniversary that came out in 2015, and there's a double disc 45 RPM Music Matters edition in 2008. The reason why is because this is phenomenal music, and so they kept reissuing it. And here we have another. My guess is that this is gonna be, again, combination of quality as well as price uh, is gonna be a good option for folks. So this album is well-loved for a good reason. The whole thing is fantastic. Certainly check out the uh, title track, Search for the New Land. And if I was going to recommend one other, it'd be the first track on side two, which is called Mr. Kenyatta. Really, really good, introspective, just moody stuff. All right, February 16th is going to be a big day. Not only do we have that Lee Morgan title, we also have Joe Henderson, Mode for Joe. Um, I love this album. So what to say about this? Recorded in 1966. Um, all original tunes by the musicians. So there's three by Joe Henderson, there's two by Cedar Walton, and there's one by Lee Morgan, and this is a septet format. So there's a lot of folks here. So who do we have? Uh, we've got Bobby Hutcherson and Joe Chambers. We've got Ron Carter and Cedar Walton. We have Curtis Fuller, Lee Morgan, and Bobby Hutcherson. Did I repeat, did I say Bobby Hutcherson already? I did. Anyway, it's a septet format. 
Um, this is one of those titles with, I would say, the least reissues overall. There was a 75th anniversary series in 2014, and there was a Music Matters reissue, double LP, 45 RPM, in 2013. But overall, over the course of, like, since 1966, it's one of the titles that's had the, uh, the least reissues. Um, this has a really nice post-bop kind of sound especially with a combination of piano and vibes. I love Blue Note albums where they're able to negotiate both instruments at the same time. And I think that the layering of horns on here is really, really nice as well. Um, I like that my copy is stereo and my guess is that the, uh, the classic uh, series is gonna be stereo. Again, because as soon as you get into these larger formats, especially this late in Blue Note's history, I just think stereo is the way to hear it. It gets a little bit too muddy when it's mono, uh, for me anyway. So nice moments are, let's see, um, where there's a Shade of Jade, which is the first track on side one. I think that that is a highlight. Um, has Hutcherson playing hits like just off the beat from the rest of the musicians and it's a really interesting kind of counterpoint decision that they did. Um, the title track mode for Joe is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I would say if there's anything other, uh, anything else to highlight, I would say that Joe Henderson's tone just throughout this entire album is amazing. Um, so really, really excited about, uh, about this particular release day. All right, on March 15th, we have some classic Miles, really classic. This is the second album that Blue Note put out in 12-inch uh, format. So this is Miles Davis Volume 2, uh, catalog number 1502. So all of this material was recorded between 1952 and 1954 and features material from three different 10-inch releases. Um, one of them is 5013, which I think is called something like Man with a Horn. Maybe Man With His Horn, something like that. Uh, I don't have that one, looking for it. Um, but it also includes material from 5022, which is um, also, funnily enough, titled Miles Davis Volume 2. And then it also has um, content from uh, catalog number 5040, or Miles Davis Volume 3. So not to confuse, but Volume 2, Volume 3, and really, well, really Volume 1 that I don't have ends up making Volume 2. I don't think they included all of the uh, all of the material, but they certainly included some of it. So the 1952 and 1953 sessions were recorded at WOR Studios, and so therefore not uh, without Rudy Van Gelder. The, um, and, and that's actually two, let's see, five tracks total from those two sessions. The 1954 session was recorded by Rudy Van Gelder. He also remastered the 52 and 53 sessions. Um, but overall, there's six, um, six tracks from that 1954 session, so there's even more content that I frankly think was just recorded a little bit better. Um, so the other thing that kind of impacts how the music sounds, perhaps, I don't necessarily hear it, but maybe you will, um, Miles obviously had um, his own sort of addiction issues, and he was um, in really rough shape for the first two sessions, but he was in recovery by the third, so that could actually play a role as well. Um, the lineup is complicated, so I'm not going to tell you how it varies by session, but some of the musicians that you will find on this, in addition to Miles Davis, are Jackie McLean, Oscar Pettiford, Percy Heath, Art Blakey, Kenny Clark, uh, Horace Silver, Gil Coggins, J.J. Johnson, and Jimmy Heath. Um, if you were going to find this uh, title otherwise, you can get it in the 75th anniversary series. Otherwise, no vinyl reissues in the U.S. since the mid-80s, to my knowledge. All right, there's just three more here. Then I'm going to go spin my copy of uh, Mode for Joe. <laughs> so also on March 15th is, uh, is another one I'm really excited about. It's Donald Byrd, A New Perspective. So um, let's see, this one was recorded in 1963. It was released about a year later. Um, has all Donald Byrd and Duke Pearson compositions. And that's actually very important because I think that Duke Pearson had a heavy hand with this one um, in terms of producing, but also compositions. And then I believe that Duke Pearson had a heavy hand with some of uh, Donald Byrd's later uh, titles as well. And I just think really added quite a bit to all of his albums from this point forward. Um, so who do we have on this one? I believe that there's a couple of, is there a couple of lineups or maybe just one? Maybe there's just one, but there's a lot of people, that's for sure. So we have um, Hank Mobley, Herbie Hancock, Kenny Burrell, Donald Best, Butch Warren, Lex Humphreys, and eight vocalists that are not credited on the back of this album. So um, what you get here in terms of the music, it's a very spiritual vibe, even gospel. Um, 
Not everyone likes this album, I will be honest, and the reason is because of the vocalists. I personally think it's fantastic, and I think it stands quite a bit apart from the other titles that Donald Byrd put out uh, where he had vocalists. So what is it, Brass and Voices is another one. I think Up for Verve was another one where he had voices. Um, I think that this is the best execution of that style. I think there might be one other I'm, I'm missing, but anyway, um, let's see. So this one was last released in 2015 as part of the 75th anniversary series. Otherwise, there hasn't been an edition since the 1980s. If I was gonna start anywhere, I would check out Beast of Burden, uh, really solid track, and the other one is Cristo Redentor. Um, so, you know, check it out, see if you like the vocal thing. What I will say is if you've never heard this album and you're just previewing it now for the first time, just because you don't like it the first time you hear it doesn't mean that you won't really, really like it like a couple of listens later. It just, it, it grows on you significantly. So keep an open mind is what I would say with this one. All right, April 19th. This is the last day of the uh, the 16 anyway releases that were announced. And this is a big one as well. And it's also one that leans a little bit later in the catalog. So the first one that we have on the 19th of April is Bobby Hutcherson's Happenings. So this one was recorded in 1966, but it was not released until 1967, actually just after the sale of Blue Note to Liberty. Um, so on here, there are six tracks that are composed by Bobby Hutcherson. There's one by Herbie Hancock, and that one happens to be Made in Voyage, which is a very um, popular track that he had on, um, well, Made in Voyage, right? Um, so in terms of the lineup, um, who do we have? We have Bob Cranshaw, we have Joe Chambers, obviously Herbie Hancock, and it's just a quartet format. So it is, um, it's, it's a little bit more sparse maybe than you'd expect from Bobby Hutcherson. Uh, if I was going to start anywhere, I would check out the tracks uh, Bouquet, which is track two on side one. And then the other one is Aquarian Moon, Aquarian Moon, which is um, track one on side one. Very post-bop, very spacey, everything that you want from Bobby Hutcherson and that he really built upon, I think, uh, heading into uh, to the 70s and even the mid to late 70s. So this one was last released in the 75th anniversary series in 2015. There was a Music Matters edition, double LP 45 RPM in 2011. That one is going to set you back. In fact, that one, I think, the, I think I saw one for sale for like $400. I mean, that's basically what you'd have to pay to get an original copy these days. So very much in demand. I think a lot of people are going to be really excited about this release. All right, the last one, April 19th. Um, and this is, a, um, this is the latest one out of all of them. It's Herbie Hancock's Speak Like a Child. One of the interesting things I always think about uh, this era of Blue Note is uh, what they called like the Unipack. I think they called it Unipack, where it's like, it's kind of a gatefold, except that where you're supposed to put the uh, the album is like in the pocket here on the inside, as opposed to uh, as opposed to on the outside. So anyway, kind of interesting. My guess, unfortunately, I'm sorry, um, is that the uh, classic vinyl reissue series will not be reproducing that because they don't do uh, gatefolds for any of these. And my guess is just gonna be a standard uh, standard cover but I could be wrong, who knows? Um, all right, so this one was recorded in 1968, and this is a very interesting album, and I'll tell you why. So firstly, the lineup includes Ron Carter, Mickey Roker, Thad Jones, Peter Phillips on bass trombone, I was not familiar with him until getting this, uh, Jerry Dodgian, um, and then there is one track, so independent of all of that entire lineup, there's actually one track that is uh, just a trio, and that one track is uh, by Ron Carter. So the reason why I said this is very interesting is that there are no solos on this album by the horns. The only solos are by Rhythm Section, and really Herbie. Um, I'm trying to think if Ron Carter has some solos, and he does. Um, so it's very interesting to use so many horns and then not to use them for solos, but really use them for backing. So for me, this album, more so than most, really highlights Herbie Hancock's compositional ability, and I think it does it in a really nice way. Um, so a, a few other interesting things about this album I think that are gonna draw potentially your interest is that um, is some of the tracks that are on here. So what we have is, um, uh, where is it? Um, so the Sorcerer is on this, um, which is obviously on Miles Davis's The Sorcerer. Then we also have the track Riot, which is on Miles Davis's Nefertiti. So not that unusual, right? Because Herbie Hancock was playing with Miles Davis, but it's kind of interesting to hear these alternative renditions, possibly closer to what 
Herbie Hancock wanted to do, or perhaps it's just, you know, different variation on, on things that he was messing around with with some of these compositions. And so I think it's really cool to be able to hear that. So with Herbie being really the predominant solo voice on this, I find a lot of the tracks to be very relaxing, very contemplative. Um, he's just a phenomenal pianist as well as a phenomenal composer, and all of that is evident on this album. Um, so otherwise, if you were going to hear this album, 75th Anniversary Series, or there was a Music Matters double, uh, double LP 45 edition in 2013. All right, you stuck with me through all 16 releases. Gosh, I wish they had a shorter release schedule or that they released it in multiple bites. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, I think you probably know where my head's at based on some of my description in terms of what I'm most excited about. It's gotta be Tina Brooks. It's the only one out of the 16 I don't have an original copy of. So obviously I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to consider picking up that one. Um, otherwise, I think folks who are interested in Blue Note and interested in music are like, this is just a phenomenal release schedule. Don't get me wrong. I know a lot of these were put out in the 75th anniversary series. And I also know that there's some overlap with Music Matters. But remember, Music Matter titles are not going to be put on Tone Poet. So don't wait for them to be put out on Tone Poet, with the exception of Blue Train. Um, and, um, you know, consider getting this, uh, this 80th anniversary slash classic vinyl series <laughs> um, yeah, because because I think that they could be good. It's still Kevin Gray, right? It's still 180 gram. It doesn't have the gate folds. It's not going to look as good on your shelves, but I mean, come on. It's like, it's great music. Um, and think about some of these releases. We've got Lee Morgan all over the place. In fact, Lee Morgan and, uh, and Herbie Hancock, I think each make four appearances um, in this uh, release schedule. But we've got, who else? I mean, we have Bobby Hutcherson. We have Joe Henderson. We have... Um, well, we have Herbie. I'm going to need to like look at this. We have Hank Mobley, Art Blakey, and the Jazz Messengers. Um, Horace Silver's blowing the blues away. I mean, even that Jimmy Smith Midnight Special record. Like, there is so much really, really quality stuff. And I know that the I would say that the um, the people who have been buying vinyl for longer, who have already taken the time to pick up some of these, might look at the release schedule and say again. Um, but I think there's a lot of new people to the hobby. I think there's a lot of people that are holding on to less than stellar editions of some of these copies or some of these records. And so I think that there's a lot of really exciting stuff here. And I may, um, I may even pick up some of these that I already have copies of just to give you all a shootout. Um, and so I'm kind of excited about that as well. So thanks for sticking with me on this 16 part Blue Note release schedule. I hope that some of this was informative, gave you a little bit of direction of maybe tracks to preview, things to consider. Build your own shopping list though, and don't let me build it for you. Um, and yeah, I'll see you next time.